you know, it's, it, it, it could be confusing, it could be led to believe that this doesn't happen. Now, most of these have been refuted, and these are just, in a certain sense, the scientific community still exists and says that we are having global warming. But people are skeptical, and there are dissenters. And the result is that only one candidate currently running for president in the Republican Party thinks that we know that global warming is happening and caused by humans. Now, you can write that off and say, oh, Republicans. But one of them is probably going to win. And even so, that's half the country. And you've got to think about what that means. And Arendt's answer is that this is the new normal. The new normal is that people are going to live in different realities. People are going to make up their facts and believe their facts based not on facts, but on their need to believe in a, in a movement or in some idea. Again, so what? Well, one answer is there are policy implications, right? If we don't take action on global warming, there may be policy problems, okay? Important, and I encourage you all to work on that. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. The RN Center is very much, and RN herself is dedicated to thinking about real world problems, not from a policy perspective, although we encourage people to do that, but trying to get to the bottom of them in a more philosophical, uh, political, theoretical sense. So what's the political problem? The political problem is, what I've just been saying, is we now live in a world in which facts are opinions and opinions are facts. And what Arendt calls this tendency to transform facts into opinion, to blur the dividing line between them, and here's a quote that's very important, raises the suspicion that it may be in the nature of the political realm to deny or pervert truth of every kind. Namely, that politics simply cannot involve truth. That's what she wants to th think about. In other words, when facts are unreliable, we lose faith in factual truth itself as a political idea. And thus, what is at stake, our antithesis, is not just one fact or another one, what is at stake is politics itself, the idea that we together as a people can come together and make a world for ourselves. Okay, is this an old problem? Hasn't it always been the case that people disagree about facts and that facts are turned into opinions? If one looks back in history, it is quickly apparent that dissensus is the norm and consensus the exception. Many who today bemoan the rise of Fox News and CNBC, along with the loss of the New York Times as a meaningful literary or journalistic endeavor, forget that for most of America's history, workers and elites, blacks and whites, northerners and southerners, read different newspapers and inhabited very different worlds. They often held very different and contradictory ideas of what America is and should be. From a historical perspective, it is actually the consensual politics of post-World War II America that is an exception not its gradual breakdown in recent decades. But what Arendt thinks is different, and what I'm going to try and suggest to you is different and matters, is that what we have today is not just different facts and disagreements, but the mass manipulation of fact. Right? The example that she likes to cite of this is the Russian, the Soviet attempt to erase uh, Trotsky from the history books. Some of you know this, but Trotsky was uh, one of the leaders of the Russian Revolution. He had a big falling out with Stalin, and Stalin basically cut, erased, rewrote, and erased him from all the history books, tried to make it so he didn't exist. Um, she calls such an attempt a totalitarian lie. And she says such manipulation is now possible. You can lie now in a way that revises all the records and creates new ones. You can destroy the evidence. On the internet and in the media, you can scrub people away, you can create false biographies, you can create false facts, you can, in a sense, unmake and make from scratch whole realities. When Arendt set out to write about totalitarianism in her first main book was called The Origins of Totalitarianism, published in 1950. 
When she set out to write about totalitarianism and emerged in the 20th century, she opposed those who saw the Nazi and Bolshevik movements as forms of tyranny or fascism. She said they were different. They're not just another tyranny, not just fascism. Instead, she argued that totalitarian government was something new, and we needed to face up to its newness. Similarly, when Arendt focused her gaze on the American Revolution in a book called On Revolution, she insisted that the American Revolution was not like other revolutions, the French or the Russian, and we needed to see what its difference was. And similarly here with facts and lying. While historical perspective is important, and it's important to remember that we've always lied in politics. In fact, she says, it may be that lying is at the essence of politics, insofar as when you lie, you change reality. And that's what a politician wants to do to a certain extent, to make things def different, better. But it's equally important to be alert to the newness of the way we lie today, the new practices and societal forms of lying. The essence of the modern political lie for Arendt is, quote, that it addresses things that are not secrets at all, but are known to practically everybody, like torture, like that 9-11 was committed against the United States, not by the United States, that global warming is happening. And yet, we don't believe these as facts. We treat them as opinions. We reduce them. How do we do this? Through what she calls thoughtlessness, the use of cliches, the rational, the rationalization of obedience or, 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 or convention. And she says that in response, what we need is a kind of thinking that returns us to um, engage the world thoughtfully, that opposes this thoughtless acceptance of the reduction of facts to opinions. And she says it's very possible that we can do this in a certain way, because the kind of full rewriting of history that totalitarianism aims for is not easy. It may even be impossible. It can't be sustained, for sure. Um, Arendt, in a number of her books, talks about, and this is one of my favorite of her phrases, she says, the holes of oblivion do not exist. The holes of oblivion do not exist. Nothing human is perfect. There are simply too many people in the world for some group or person to pull off a complete defactualization of the world. Someone, somewhere, is going to have known that it's untrue and is going to stand up and say something. As she says, one man will always be alive to tell the story. And when one does, that story is part of our world can't be forgotten. But if the images created by media fabricators today are not um, are not totalizing, right? They don't. They're not going to be. We're not in a totalitarian moment. No one group has the monopoly on spin and images. They nevertheless have an important and corrosive effect upon our political culture. The image of America as a nation that doesn't torture as a nation of human rights, prevails over the facts. It causes doubt. The image of America as a response, a doubt that we torture. The image of America as a responsible country prevails over the irresponsibility about doing nothing over global warming. And it causes doubt about whether we should. And the image that the government is covering something up about its own involvement in 9-11 causes doubt about whether we can trust the government to deal with these kind of crises. There's a kind of self-deception going on where we deceive ourselves about who we are and what we are. We now face a world of multiple images, multiple realities, fully built, fully built echo chambers of monomaniacal self-certainty. Those who watch Fox News on one side, those who watch CNBC on the other, the truthers on one side, the, the, the environmentalists on one side, the, 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 uh, the environmental deniers on the other. And these various worldviews, each hermetic, clash against one another whenever they are forced outside their internal world. The danger is not necessarily that one of these views will prevail. As soon as they gain a certain popularity, they usually re their, their internal logic breaks down and people begin to see them as, as a bit crazy. The danger is that the powerlessness of images to triumph 
It does not, however, mean that they're innocuous. The danger is in the elevation of image over fact and the blurring of the line between fact and opinion, which leads our end rights to cynicism. And this, again, is the point that I want to drive home. The overall point that Arendt worries about in truth and politics is not simply that one version of the lie, the right version or the wrong version, will win. Rather, it is a danger that amidst the battle over facts, the very belief in the ability to say what is, to know the world, is put into question. Arendt's worry is that the war over images leads not to the victory of one image over another, but to the victory of cynicism, to the belief that it is simply not possible to speak the truth. And then the next point I want to make, because it's also a second central point of her essay, is that there is no remedy for such cynicism. It's a hard fact, and it's at the core of her argument. There is no remedy for the blurring of fact and opinion and the resulting cynicism, because at bottom facts are contingent and vulnerable. A tower, she says, a tower of factual truth in the unlikely event that he wished to stake his life on a particular fact. If I wish to say global warming exists and I'm going to stake my life on it, how could I do it? I could sacrifice myself. I could burn myself in Times Square or on the mall in Washington. But as she says, this doesn't tell anything about the truthfulness of my point. For why should the liar stick to his lies with great courage, especially in politics, where he might be motivated by patriotism or some kind of legitimate group partiality? There's just no way to make the truth prevail. It's easy, she says, to discredit factual truths. Much of factual truth comes from eyewitness accounts, which are notoriously unreliable. For those of you who ever go to law school, you'll learn this very quickly. The most unreliable piece of evidence admitted in the law are eyewitness testimony. People don't remember what they think they remember. Documents can be forged. When a dispute emerges as to a witness or a document, there's no higher judge who can decide the matter. And thus, the settlement of factual disputes is a majority decision. Now, does that mean that she thinks there are no facts, as many philosophers, and I'm sure some of you believe? No, it doesn't. Arendt insists that there are facts. Of course, facts must be interpreted. They must be selected, picked out of chaos, and formed into a story. And yes, every generation has the right to write its own story. But that is not the same right as the right to touch the factual matter itself. And yet, the factual matter is in danger. That's her point. Here, and it's, for those of you who've read the essay, the opening footnote is important to consider. Arendt tells you in that opening footnote that the essay arises out of her own experience. Some of you know this, but her most famous book is a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, about the trial of Adolf Eichmann. It was originally written as a, a, a series of essays for the New Yorker magazine. And it caused quite a controversy. Um, uh, although she doesn't think it caused the controversy because she thinks the controversy had nothing to do with her book. Um, and she says that it was her experience of this controversy that led her to write this essay. And she identifies two issues in that footnote. She says, first, it, it made me ask the question, is it always legitimate to tell the truth? 